borrow a few shirts here? Can you borrow a few shirts? So uh, I want to start, so uh, there's going to be presentation, uh, so uh, two things that you can kind of do in parallel. So the course website is over here, so you can just, oops, so this is the calendar thing, but if you just go to cs.toronto.edu tilde my name slash 180. Uh, that is not updated. This the year is 2023, probably. Uh, so that's the course website, which you can explore. So I would also like to ask you to download Paizo. So if you go to paizo.org and go to Quick Start, there's gonna be an installer for Windows and there's gonna be an installer for Mac. It's not essential that you do it right away, although it might help. Uh, certainly by the start of next week, I would like, like to ask for everyone to have installed it. I don't need it, I already have it. Uh, so, okay. Uh, so, uh, if you're familiar with Python, uh, Python might look a little bit exotic to you. If you're new, might as well. Uh, we will switch to VS Code at some point during the semester. However, I believe that in the beginning, Python is actually better for learning. Okay, I'll make myself a little bit quieter. Uh, so, uh, Golf9, are you fine? Do you hear me? Cool. All right. Uh, so, all right. I was looking up the NATO phonetic alphabet just like now. I, I knew Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie. I was like, what's D? I don't know. It's, it's Delta, E is Echo, I, although I'm tempted to say Epsilon. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, G is Golf. Uh, so, okay, all right. Uh, so as you're doing that, uh, I'm going to do some slides and then we'll jump right into the class. So I'll do the intro slides. I'll show you uh, a little bit about what the class is about, but I can't really tell you the entire story in part because, well, I can't really say much before you've done at least a little bit of programming and then we'll come back at some point to what the class is about. Uh, so for now, uh, here are some pictures of the people who kind of laid the intellectual foundations to what we're going to be doing in this class. Uh, so I know how, how many people recognize the person on the very left? It's Kurt Gatto. Then uh, uh, the, uh, the person in the army uniform would be Admiral Grace Hopper, who's known for developing the first com compiler. Uh, in the middle uh, with a Google t-shirt is Guido van Rossum, so the designer of the Python programming language. Uh, John von Neumann, uh, pretty much unless otherwise specified, if you see something in computer science, John von Neumann probably invented it. Uh, Alan Turing, uh, uh, multiple contributions actually, so both in terms of kind of practically building one of the first computers and also laying out uh, some of the foundations for computer science. Uh, this is a picture of uh, ENIAC, so I believe that's in uh, that's around the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. 
Uh, so this is one of the first computers. Uh, so nowadays they're smaller. Uh, that, for people who don't know, is the Anxite Crest designed by Professor Deleterio, who retired uh, last year, actually. But we have it, so we, we, we put it everywhere that we can. It kind of looks nice. Uh, so, okay, uh, so uh, just quickly about me, uh, whatever. Uh, so my name is Michael Gerjoy, uh, so pronounced Gerjoy, um, do your best. Uh, so I'm, I'm a teaching stream professor in engineering science. I'm also technically in mechanical industrial engineering. Uh, most of my teaching is actually in ANXI. MIE just pays my salary. Uh, so I'm also a fellow scientist at St. Michael's Hospital. Uh, I'm basically ESC 180 is the course that I started my teaching career with, and you know that's that's where I wanted to stay. Although I left several times, uh, so I started. I went to grad school in 2007, uh, and I was just randomly assigned to be a teaching assistant for this course, uh, and then I just kind of became head TA, and then I taught it while in graduate school, and now I came back to U of T to teach it. Uh, so in terms of research work, I'm uh, primarily a computer vision person, although I kind of branch out into machine learning, applied statistics, especially applications of data science uh, to healthcare, stuff like that, both as research and as industry. So in industry, I worked in computer vision. Uh, so uh, if you, uh, nobody does that anymore, but if you want to buy an Epson scanner, there is still software there that was written by, by yours truly. Uh, so buy an Epson scanner, it's good. Uh, and more recently, I've been doing machine learning for healthcare, stuff like that. Uh, so that mostly involves uh, gaining insights from large data sets uh, of patients. Uh, so for example, we worked on predicting adverse outcomes for patients in the hospital based on data that comes in about the patient in the hospital, so stuff like what's in their chart, whatever their test results were, whatever procedures were ordered, stuff like that. We were trying to assign a, a kind of a risk score that indicates if the risk score is high, that uh, an ad adverse uh, outcome is likely for the patient, so you want to pay more attention for them. I also do a little bit of uh, data science consulting on the site, so that's, that's me. Uh, so the class, uh, so mostly everything is on the course website. Uh, so this year I actually put most of the content from last year on the website. This is not to say that the course is not going to change. I try to make it better every year to variable success. Sometimes I make it worse by accident. But uh, most of it is there, so if you want to look ahead at you know, what are the future readings approximately and what are the contents approximately of what you're going to see in the future, you can just go to the course website and see. Uh, so if you click on the calendar here, uh, so this one is updated. And then uh, this is actually from last year, so before every lecture, I'll try to put up whatever is the stuff that... I'm planning to do in that particular lecture. It's not a guarantee that it's going to be exactly the same. In fact, we kind of spent a bunch of the summer trying to make better notes. So as the semester goes on, before lecture, generally, I'll try to put up a fresh version of the notes. Uh, so I also record everything on YouTube. So uh, I'll put up uh, YouTube live stream links. Uh, and you can watch the lecture on YouTube if you like. Uh, so um, I, I don't think this, today, it makes sense. We'll also have a Discord window that you can ask questions on during lecture, and hopefully maybe some of your classmates uh, will uh, kind of respond, because probably I can't be all kind of on Discord and lecturing at the same time. Uh, so uh, there is also a course form on Piazza, so please sign up right away. Uh, if you don't, I, I, I'll sign you up. It's, it's not, I have, I'll have a little list of everyone in Anxi. I'll, I'll, I'll sign everyone up. But you can sign up right away. You can ask whatever question you want, stuff like that. Uh, and that's probably, so one, it's mandatory reading. So if there's any announcements, they would go on Piazza. Yes. It, it is, yes. So if you go to welcome to ESC 180, that's, that's it. All right. 
so any announcements uh, are going to be on Piazza. It's considered mandatory reading, so you can't come to me and say, oh, I haven't read the announcement on Piazza. No, uh, that, that had to do with grading, whatever. No, you have to read it. Uh, so uh, marks. Uh, so the marking scheme for this year is going to be like this. Uh, so we're going to have various things. So uh, midterm, exam, pretty straightforward. You go into a room. Uh, you suffer for a couple hours. You go out. Then we grade you. Uh, so um, the, other, the other aspects are hopefully a little bit more pleasant. Uh, so we'll have labs. Uh, so about, well, not about. There's going to be nine of them. Uh, each one is going to be worth 1%. The labs are going to start next week, so you have your lab in your schedule. Uh, I'll talk about the labs in a second as well. There's going to be quizzes, and there's going to be online exercises, and there's going to be projects, which are basically homework. Uh, so about the labs. Uh, so I don't require people to prep for the lab. Uh, it's not realistic, given your schedule, for people to do lectures and also labs and also prepare for the labs. The idea is you come into the lab to work. You don't have to prepare. Uh, the lab assignments are going to be posted on the course webpage before the lab, uh, sometimes quite uh, not, not very long before the lab. But you can see last year's labs on the website. It's not guaranteed that they'll stay the same. So the labs are going to be posted every Tuesday. Uh, so you must work with a partner, uh, and the reason is it's just not feasible for us to support people working alone. So we do ask you to work with a partner. Uh, you can find one before the lab. So on Piazza, there's going to be a post where if you don't have a partner, you can just say, hey, like, does anyone want to work with me? Uh, if you can't find a partner, you can go to the TA in the lab and say, hey, I don't have a partner. The TA will find a partner for you. Uh, it's theoretically possible that there's going to be an odd number of students on any given day, so someone must go without a partner, but that's an exception, and it's, it's most one student. So the way the labs work in this course is we're not trying to take away your mark. So if you make a good effort toward completing a lab, and most everyone almost always does, so like it's a very rare situation where a person comes in and just like doesn't want to do any work, doesn't do anything, doesn't even try, then okay, we, we need to talk about that. But, and the TAs will talk to you about that if they see that that's the situation. But like most labs, most of the time, everyone gets full credit. So don't, don't stress out about that. Uh, the lab TAs are going to be there. They're going to introduce themselves to you at the start of the lab. Uh, I encourage you to ask questions. That's what they're there for. Uh, at the end of the lab, the lab TAs are going to go around and check your lab. So really, we're looking for, like, has done something, wasn't like, on well, you, you're not on Facebook anymore, I guess, wasn't scrolling TikTok the entire time. If that's the situation, then uh, you'll get full marks, and the TAs will uh, give you the mark on Quirkus. Uh, so this is something new that I'm doing this year. We'll see how it goes. I don't think it's going to be very popular, but I think it might be good for people. Uh, so there's going to be pop quizzes, 12 of them, uh, throughout the term during lecture. Uh, so uh, I'll count the best eight out of 12 quizzes for your mark. Uh, so that means if you get you know, 100% of eight of the quizzes and 0% of four of the quizzes, you get 100% for the quizzes. Uh, so it's not a huge deal if you skip a lecture and there is a quiz and you get a zero, okay, fine, but it's best eight out of 12. Uh, the quizzes will contain questions taken from the previous two, three lectures. Uh, that's not gonna start until week three, so don't, like, don't stress out for now, and I'll, give you more detail about the format at the end of week two. So the goal here, again, kind of, we do do assessment here at U of T, so that's why we have exams and we have the midterm, but the goal for the quizzes is, is not to, like, you know, take away your marks, and it's not really to assess how well you're doing in the course. Because, like, it's, it's very difficult to do it with a short quiz. The goal is really to make sure that people don't fall behind in lecture and then stop attending because they say, oh, like I missed 
you know, last week's lectures anyway. I'm not going to understand anything if I come, so I'm not going to come. And then it piles up and up, and you're more and more behind. So the idea with the quizzes is to make sure that there is some, in some small incentive for you to keep up with the lecture and to come to lecture as well. Yes? One. Uh, yeah, and that, uh, you were thinking like a computer scientist. I like that. Uh, so, so the question was, is it week zero or week one? Of course, in computer science, a lot of the time you start from zero, but uh, in, in, in this instance, uh, this, this is week one, and then at the end of, well, week two uh, will, will be more, uh, there, there's going to be more detail. So I don't intend for those questions to be kind of extremely difficult or anything like that. I'll try to design them in such a way that they are just an incentive to keep up rather than something that's a source of additional stress. But we'll see. Uh, so that's, that's the first time that I'm trying to do it in Anxi. I did it uh, uh, for a course at another place, uh, and it worked okay. Like, I don't think people liked it, but I think overall it was good. Uh, so there's also going to be online exercises. So those will, will be posted around week two, three through week five. And th those are, again, the goal is not to take away points. It's more to make sure that everyone has done kind of a bare minimum by themselves at the computer. So uh, that's going to be posted. And again, kind of in terms of uh, how much things are worth, that's just going to be worth 2%. So not a big deal, just making sure that people are not behind. Uh, so I'm about to start talking about actual programming, and there's not a lot that I can say about programming to someone who hasn't done any yet, because, well, you won't know what I'm talking about anyway, but I will say a little bit. Uh, so learning to program is more like learning to swim or learning to ride a bike or learning how to play an instrument or something like that than like learning history in high school or something. Not, not to say that history doesn't require higher order skills, but here you can really see, like you can be at the best lecture about how to swim, but you really don't want to get in the pool just based on the lecture. Like there is no way that someone can tell you. Uh, so, okay. Uh, uh, so, that's interesting. Uh, uh, so that's kind of one aspect of it. Really kind of practice and actually trying things is the only way that you can learn. So there is only so much you can do with lecture uh, other than kind of give you the basic context and tell you where to start. Really it's about trying to do it yourself. Uh, another analogy is, you know, something like learning French. So, uh, and kind of some of you, uh, I, I think probably most of you will have had some experience learning a new uh, natural language. Uh, and there's various techniques, and some are good, some are bad. So, a bad technique for teaching a natural language is like pull out a dictionary and say like, you know, dog means young and cat means cha and here's another hundred words in French, now put them together. Uh, some people do teach French like that in Ontario and the result is that nobody in Ontario knows how to speak French. Uh, so, uh, so the really good way to learn a language, as you probably know if you have successfully done it, is to just be in an environment where a language is spoken and trying to speak it yourself. So uh, that's that. It is kind of like that in programming. Now, programming languages are not nearly as complex as human languages. So programming languages are fully understood. Well, it, we'll see in a bit. Kind of at first, programming language. Those are fully understood. They're completely defined. That it's not like that with natural language. So building a grammar for any natural language is usually. An open, pro an open problem. So you have general patterns, but really understanding the grammar completely, understanding all the phenomena of a natural language grammar, that's like linguists like work full time on that and there's still work left to do, 
on any natural language. It's not like that with programming, but it's still the situation that you need to practice, you need to read code, you need to write code in order to understand it. There is only so much you can do by just saying, like, here's the rule for how this works, here's the rule for how that works, and so on. So, okay. Uh, so, one last thing. So, I haven't done a survey yet. I will send out a survey uh, to you soon about kind of what kind of experience you have, stuff like that. But generally, my experience is it's about 50 50 in this class between people who have some programming experience and people who don't have any. And the class is really aimed at making sure that by the end of the semester, everyone has the basics of programming. So that means that if you have some experience, depending on how much experience you have, maybe the first couple of weeks are going to be a little bit slow, and possibly the first couple of months are going to be a little bit slow. So in my experience, again, I haven't done a survey. I, ha I was on the admissions committee, but I haven't seen most of your guys' files. I have seen some. Uh, but in my experience, usually about like 15, 20% of the class, okay, like maybe don't need this class. Uh, and that's fine. You can sit in a corner and do calculus homework. I'm, I'm sure Jim Davis will, will provide entertainment. Uh, so uh, that's like that. So, okay, all right. Uh, so uh, are there questions about anything? Yes. Sorry, just one sec. Uh, okay, I'm getting used to. Okay, can you try speaking into the microphone? Uh, sorry, which which laptop? I think, uh, so in general, kind of as we get closer, thank you, so as we get closer to midterm time, we'll talk more. The question was kind of how picky are we in terms of grading, and the answer is, well, it depends a little bit on the question, right? So if the question is really a problem-solving question where you need to solve some kind of problem, we're looking at whether you did solve the problem or not, but if it's a short question that's just asking you about how this particular thing in the programming language works, well, you got to be picky about something there because it's a one-line answer. So it, it kind of depends on the question. In general, you know, we try to be reasonable. All right, yes. Uh, it's on your schedule. Uh, they're adjacent, so yeah, so you, you can go to either one, it's just about kind of which one is full. Yeah. Uh, they're going to be on Google Forms. So, on the internet. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, buy textbooks. Uh, so, uh, that's a good question. So, uh, I list two So I list two textbooks on the syllabus. Uh, they're not required. Uh, one of them is free. Well, all textbooks are free online, but one of them is really free. Uh, and then uh, the second book, uh, it's not very expensive. I think it's like 25 bucks. Uh, some people say that they find it useful. I'm not requiring any readings at all beyond the course notes. Uh, if you want, you can check it out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, and the question was, uh, they use VS Code instead of Paizo. Uh, the answer is basically yes. So, uh, during the lab for labs one and two, there's going to be a required component that will require that you use Paizo. Uh, if you can figure out how to be equivalent in VS Code by yourself, you're welcome to do that. If not, then for those particular ones, just for them for labs one and two, we will ask that you use Paizo. Otherwise, you're welcome to use without using. Yeah. Um, are we allowed to use our own natural first 
that's an interesting question. So the question was, uh, are, we, are you allowed to use the laptop uh, to work in the lab? Uh, and in the lab, of course, if people don't know, there are kind of stationary, uh, station, stations, uh, workstations that you can work on. So I strongly recommend, I'm, the answer to your question is do whatever you want. Uh, however, I strongly recommend uh, getting used to working at a workstation with a real large monitor and a real mouse. In my experience, that makes a big difference in terms of how efficient you can be. And some people are so used to the laptop that they don't realize how much better it is to work at the workstation. So I encourage you to at least try it. If you don't like it, you can switch to your laptop. All right. Yeah. Sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, E11? Yeah, let's try it again. Uh, well, it says it's on. <laughs> okay, can you just speak up? Oh, on Android, uh, I don't believe so. Uh, you, you can try. Uh, so you could also just use pythontutor.com. So pythontutor.com uh, for, for now. Uh, so in general, uh, so it's like a Chromebook or something. I, uh, so I think you can figure something out, but I'm not sure. Sorry. Oh, uh, I'm not sure if like people, so are people actually like, uh, so uh, B04, are you waiting to ask a question? B04? Yes. Um, is there going to be a limit on libraries which we can use during practicals? During practicals? Uh, well, so there might be a question that says, uh, but it's not necessary. Like, for this question, you don't get to use this Thing because probably I'm asking you to do Okay, other questions? Yeah. Uh, three. Uh, I, I, I mean, uh, it, it doesn't really matter. So, uh, what I, like 310 is five, whatever. Okay? All right, so let's start uh, doing some actual work. Uh, so here I have uh, 3.7 for some reason, but okay. So, okay, all right. So uh, this is what it looks like if you open Paizo. So uh, what we have is on the left is where we write the program. On the right is what's called a shell. So. First, I'm going to write a little bit in the shell just to give you an idea for some of the components of Python. So one way to think about Python is as just an extension of a calculator. So for example, you can say 4 plus 5, and Python is going to say, well, the value of that is 9, or something like 25 minus 34, and that minus 9. So here is something that's kind of like a calculator, but not quite. So I can ask Python, is 3 equal to 3? So this needs to be two equal signs. We'll go in more detail later on. And here, the answer is going to be true. 3 is equal to 3. So in the same way that the value of 25 minus 34 was minus 9, the value of 3 equals to 3 is true because 3 is equal to 3. On the other hand, if you try something like 3 is equal to 4, the value of that is going to be false. So that's kind of like a calculator, except now the value is true or false rather than an integer. So you can also do something a little bit more complicated. So for example, is 2 plus 6 equal to 12? Well, this should be false because 2 plus 6 is 8 and 12 is 12, so that is false. So you can also enter things that are not numerical. So I can, for example, say, what's the value of 
hello in quotes, and the answer as well, the value is hello in quotes. Right? So in the same way that this is a number, so the value of this was minus 9, and then this is true or false, and the value of this was true, this is text, and the value of this is the text hello. In Python, it so happens that you can do math with text, so this is referred to as a string. So I can say, for example, ang plus psi, and that's going to be ang psi. So in general, you, you can just add strings like this. Uh, so a funny uh, feature of that is that you can generalize. So if you do ha plus ha plus ha plus ha 10 times, that's going to be ha 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 ha. And you can think about it as ha times 10. So ha plus ha plus ha and so on 10 times. So, yeah. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll get to that later. Uh, so for now, we're just asking kind of what's the value of this, and the answer is ha, 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 ha. So, okay. And again, this is like ha plus ha. Like the reason this works is because that's how multiplication works, right? Now, it's a, quick, well, it's a design feature of Python that that's how they chose, chose to do it. It wouldn't come out automatically. It just happens that... Well, for a silly reason, like you don't usually need this, but you can multiply strings uh, by numbers. Okay? So another thing you can do in Python is uh, store values in memory. So I can say something like mem is equal to 42, so what this does is it say, says take 42 and put it in mem, so mem for memory. And now the value of mem is 42. The value of mem plus 5 is 47. Why? Just because this says put 42 into mem, and now whenever I say mem, Python will know that I meant 42. So you can kind of remember values this way. All right. So let's do an example. So let's do a variable. We'll name it angsci, like this. And then we'll say angsci plus 5. So if I run this, so here I started writing on the program pane, and this is just so that you see both of those at the same time. So I can highlight this and press Alt-Enter to effectively put angsci equals 42 on the right. So now the value of angsci I can check is 42. So now the value of this is 47. So again, what I've done is highlighted this and pressed Alt Enter. Uh, so, by the way, uh, especially in the beginning, uh, it it might look to some of you like I'm typing too fast, and uh, part of it is there's just tricks to how to do it fast. So, in order to select, for example, this, I put the cursor using my arrow arrow keys. I put the cursor here. And then I press on a PC, I press shift end. On a Mac, I believe it's command shift right. And that selects the entire thing for me. So similarly, if the cursor is at the end, I'll press shift, shift home, command shift left to select the entire line. So if I hold down shift, I can use the arrow keys in order to select regions of the text. It's useful to learn how to do those things. Trying to do it with a touchpad is extremely annoying. So learning to use the arrows is, is useful, and it's like not nearly as difficult as some of the stuff you guys do in video games. So, yeah. 
Uh, so, okay. So that's like that. So now I'll do something that's a little bit interesting. So I can say ang psi is equal to ang psi plus 42, well, 43, let's say. So if I run all of that, so what I've done is I selected everything and say, said old enter, and then I query what the value of ang psi is, the answer is 85. So what happened here? Well, we said put 42 in Anxi, and then we said Anxi plus five, the value of this was nine, uh, well, I didn't say Anxi plus 42, so the value of this is 47, but that is not saying change Anxi. On the other hand, this is saying take this and now take whatever this is and put it in Anxi. Right? So here I'll write it as a comment. So anything that's after the hash sign, the pound sign, uh, Python is just going to ignore. I'm just writing whatever I want. So xi is now 42. And here it's going to be xi is still 42. But xi plus 5 is 47. And now I'm saying take 42 plus 43 and put it in Anxi. So now Anxi is 85. Make sense? So, uh, by the way, yeah, so that's a pet peeve of mine. Please don't call it hashtag. Uh, the reason it's called a hashtag, it's like a tag that's associated with the hash sign. So this is hash or pound, not hashtag. That's, that's something different on Twitter or I suppose on X as it's now known. Uh, so, so, okay. So this is a little bit different from what you've seen in math, right? So in math, if you say something like X equals 42, you cannot then say x is equal to x plus 43, right? Because, well, if you say it, so just in math, well, what you would say about this is, well, it's, if it's an equation, doesn't have a solution, uh, if it's an assertion that x is equal to, uh, to x plus 43, it's just false. It's not, unlike in Python, it's not an instruction to change the value of x. In Python, it's not like that. In Python, you have an instruction that says put 42 in xi, and then we just had xi plus 5, which is, has the value, but it's not an instruction. And then we have an instruction of take xi plus 43, and put it in Anxi. So that is basically what the program is. A program, this is a program, it doesn't do much that's useful, but it's a program. A program is a series of instructions to the computer to change some values in memory. That's, that's basically what it is. So here we have a program where we started with 42, and then eventually we change the value 42 to whatever 42 plus 43 is. So not super useful, but okay. So one way to make it slightly more useful is to actually print something to the screen. So I can say, for example, print anxi here. So if I run this entire program, so remember anything after the pound sign doesn't count. So here I'm running the program. So here it says Anxi starts at 42, and then Anxi becomes Anxi, the old Anxi plus 43, and then we say print Anxi. So that's an instruction to print something to the screen, and indeed, if we run it, we'll print 85, which is 42 plus 43. So there was a question before about like when do you use print and when do you not use print? Uh, it's a little bit tricky because the answer 
in about six weeks is going to be you basically never use print. Uh, it's, so print is for printing something to the screen in a very kind of constrained way. Generally, what you want to output to the screen is some fancy graphics. You wouldn't do it with print anyway. Uh, but for now, the answer is in the shell, I can just say stuff and get the value of whatever I say. So I don't need to say print. If in a program I want to output something, I have to say print. So I cannot say just ng site plus five. In fact, I said that and it didn't print anything, right? So if I run this, then the only output is 85, the 85 from here. Make sense? So, okay. So, let's write another program. So this one is gonna be a little bit useful. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll have my ANXA adjustment, which is going to be, let's say, 20. And we'll have like a high school average, which is going to be, let's, let's say, 98. I don't actually know what the average is this year, something like this, uh, maybe a little bit lower. Uh, and then let's say that we want to adjust. So. Uh, we want to say ANXI average is high school average minus ANXI adjustment. And then what I'll do is I'll print the ANXI average. So I can now highlight all of this and press Alt Enter. So if you don't remember, uh, if you don't remember the uh, the Alt Enter thing, you can always say Run and then find the Alt Enter that's Execute Selection. And you see here, so this program has run, and now what I can do, it's not super useful, but I can say, well, like, what if the ANXI adjustment this year? Like, we, uh, like the profs become nicer and now the ANXI adjustment is merely 19.5, then the ANXI average would be 78.5, right? So it's, 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 a, it's a useful program, okay? Uh, sorry to say this is, this is pretty realistic. Uh, so <laughs> now, of course, you know, uh, it's kind of what the grade you earn is up to you. This is like the average. But on average, yeah, that's 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 about the head that you should expect to take. So okay. Uh, what time is it? Six four fifty five. So okay. Uh, questions so far. Questions about this. All right. Let's do another program. So let's say that I want to compute the absolute value of a number. So what's the absolute value of a number? Well, the absolute value of x is x if x is greater or equal than 0, and it's minus x if x is smaller than 0. Make sense? That's, that's just what an absolute value is. If it's minus 5, then the absolute value is minus minus 5, so just 5. Uh, if it's positive, then the absolute value of x is just x. So here's how you can write it in Python. So I'll set x to be, for example, minus 5. And then uh, here's how I write it. So what I'm doing is I'm giving Python an instruction. So the instruction is if x is greater or equal than 0, then print x. Else, meaning if it's not greater or equal than 0, then I say print minus x. 
So I'll first run it and then I'll explain it. So here I run it and the absolute value of minus five indeed works out to five. So there are various components here and programming, unlike English, for example, there are specific rules about how you write anything, everything that you cannot really deviate from. Uh, those rules are referred to as syntax. So syntax comes from linguistics originally, right? So in English, syntax is the rules about how you can combine different kinds of words into sentences, right? So for example, you can say the apple is yellow, but you cannot say is yellow apple dot. And that's because this is how English syntax works. The has to come before apple, for example. It's not like that necessarily in all other languages. So if you know some other languages, you can see that the syntax for those languages might be different from what you're used to in English. Right? Uh, so similarly, in Python, the syntax for this kind of thing is this. So specifically, it's if you want what's called a conditional statement. So you say if and then you have the condition, so you have something that's either true or false, then you have to have a column that's required in the same way that in English you can say the apple but not apple the. So you have to have a column after the condition. Uh, you have to have indentation, so you have to have white, some kind of white space, I usually just press tab, before the thing that happens if the condition is true. And then you can have an else, you have to have the column, and again, you have to have white space here before you say what happens, uh, what happens under the else. Okay, so if you write in Paizo, Paizo will help, help you along. So for example, if I say if x is greater or equal than zero, uh, and then I just press enter, it already inserted white space for me. So it'll help you a little bit, but uh, you have to know the rules. Uh, all right, uh, people are getting restless, but there is one more minute left. Uh, but anyway, uh, I will see you on Monday. Bye. Thank you.
Yeah, I'm just going outside to ask a question. 